Good evening and welcome everyone to Women in Film Seattle's The Second Tuesday event for April 2021. I'm Lisa Hammond. I'm currently the president of the Seattle chapter. And first to get started, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. Um, it's not always appropriate coming from someone that's not a native or indigenous person, but you have me tonight. So please, we would like to acknowledge that our organization's offices are on the traditional lands of the Cowlitz, Clackamas, Adfalati, Coast Salish, Stillaguamish, Duwamish, and Sukuwamish, as well as having membership spread across numerous native lands. We honor with gratitude the land and these people past and present. I'd also like to thank our members and our sponsors. Um, this month, I'd like to shout out IATSE, our local 48, was, is one of our long-term sponsors and many of our members um, belong to that local. Well, I'm happy to celebrate um, SIF and tonight we've got some incredible guests. Um, SIF has been, this year has really embraced um, a lot of our native local filmmakers around the state from the east side, south side, the west side, the north side. We've got um, Potato Dreams of America, Wes Hurley's film with our with Misha Jakupek, producer, S.J. Chiro, director of East of the Mountains with the amazing DP, Sebastian Scanducci, right? So close, Lisa, so, I was so close. <laughs> that was great, that was great. And the lovely and talented Nikkei Imoru, executive producer of All Those Small Things. Susan LaSalle, DGA, amazing, extraordinary UPM and woman in film emerita is here to be our host, our moderate our panel. We'll take questions in the sidebar and um, after we'll go through uh, some questions and, and you know what I meant by that. So Susan, enjoy the evening, take it away. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Lisa, and um, really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so I would love for people that don't know who you are or who haven't seen the films yet for each of us to just introduce ourselves briefly um, and talk about where where you all are from and um, and what films um, you're representing tonight. So should we start with um, Misha and go go from there? Sure, thanks, Susan. <clears throat> My name is Misha Jakubczak, and I am originally from uh, Missoula, Montana, but have been in the Seattle area and also got the opportunity to work in the Spokane area right. years ago with Nikkei. Um, and uh, on this one, I actually had the opportunity to work on East of the Mountains and um, am also uh, producing with West Potato Dreams of America. Um, and um, just really happy to be here. Thanks for having us. I will take you in the order. Wes, you're, you're right next to Misha on my screen. So go right ahead. Um, <clears throat> my name is Wes Hurley. I'm originally from Russia's Far East and Vladivostok. And um, with Misha, I produced and directed wrote um, my autobiographical feature called Potato Dreams of America. And it's about my growing up gay in the USSR and then coming over to Seattle uh, with my amazing mom, who's kind of the hero of the film. Great, and SJ? Hi, I'm SJ Chiro and I directed East of the Mountains. Um, I had a film in SIF, or I should say we did because Sebastian and I worked together. Um, this is our second feature film uh, in 2017 called Lane 1974. Nikkei? Hi, I'm uh, Nikkei. I'm the executive producer, producer and casting director for all those small things. 
Uh, I'm originally from London and I live now in um, Washington state. I move fluidly between the west and the east side. Beautiful. And Sebastian. Hi, uh, Sebastian Skandiutsi and uh, the DP of East of the Mountains and just happy to be here. Wonderful. And I hear Sarah Crow is waiting to be let in. So if we could let Sarah Crow in, mm -hmm. we might catch her to do her intro there. Here she comes. Sarah? Hi. Hi, thanks for joining. Um, we just made it to the intros. There you are. So if you'd like to intro yourself, it looks like you're still on set, but we'd love it if you just give a little introduction uh, of who you are and where you're from. Sure, uh, I'm Sarah Crow, and I was an executive producer on Potato Dreams of America. And Susan's right, I was just on set, so hence the mask. <laughs> thanks, thanks. So uh, without further ado, I just wanna say, uh, all of these films, and I will say, Nika, as I watched the trailer and said, oh my gosh, that looks so interesting. And it's playing at SIF right now. So um, can't wait to catch that tonight because as, as if you don't know, if you want to see a film, you can just um, go and pay for it and, and watch it at your leisure in your own time, which is very different from most festivals um, you know, prior to COVID. So it's a real luxury to be able to see these films when you wanna see them. Um, but I'd also like to say that I, I feel like um, the people on this panel are a triple threat. Um, most of you have done many things with the exception of Sebastian, who's just an amazing director of photography. Um, but, but all of you, um, including Wes, um, having watched his film, I can tell that he, he did more than just direct the film. Because <laughs> that, that is quite a film, Wes. Um, so, so I would love to just get it started with um, uh, M M Misha and talk about, um, you know, how these films came to you, how you got started with them, you know, what drew you to them, um, why these two amazing directors. <laughs> it's a lot, a lot to, to talk about and we'll, we'll try to make it quick so we can keep everybody in the mix. Awesome, thanks, Susan. Yeah, so um, I guess the first I'll talk about Potato Dreams of America. Um, I met Wes probably about six years ago and got an opportunity to read his script and fell in love with it immediately. The humor in it, the it, it was it's so compelling in the fact that it was a you know is a true story about his life. Um, completely had me enthralled and. Um, got to know Wes and came on as a producer. And um, it's it's been a long road as, as all of us can probably testify that, that films um, take a long time to see through. And um, so they, they really all are labors of love. And um, this one for sure was, uh, we did two shorts before based on the same story. We did an immersive VR short um, that ended up premiering at AFI. And then we did a short documentary um, little potato that went to South by as well. And those were both, um, you know, projects in and of themselves. And we shepherded them through the festivals and put them out into the world, but they were always sort of part of the bigger dream, which was to make the feature. Um, and um, so we, yeah, we ended up wrapping last year, uh, two weeks before COVID really exploded. And we're just so fortunate. I, I think Nikkei had similar timeline where it's like, they're, you know, so, so lucky um, to be in post-production the past year, um, which, you know, it's just, um, yeah. Anyways, and, and then, you know, I had uh, met Jane Charles before and of course knew SJ and fell in love with, uh, the first beautiful film, Lane 1974, that she and Sebastian collaborated on. And um, was that was one of, I think, really the best, you know, sort of first feature films. I, I was blown away by it and um, jumped at the opportunity to work with both of them again. And um, just, uh, yeah, it, it just has been a um, really a, a pleasure 
to see films at, at this phase for anybody. I feel like it's such a time of celebration where it's just like, holy shit, this film got made, like we're actually sharing it with the world. And it's, and it's such a, such a weird time to be sharing films because everything is virtual, but I definitely look forward to, um, to seeing everybody when we start having follow-up screenings in person someday in the near future. Well, and both those films um, would do well with an audience, you know, as a group experience. And I think that's probably what some of us are, are hopeful that we'll get a redo once this all is over and people can go back to the theaters. I mean, they are now, but, but not to the extent. Um, and then I don't want to leave Nike out here as far as like choosing um, to do um, all those small things. What was your, what was your process and in, in how you landed on that film? Well, um, I'm um, partnered with Rebecca Petriello and together we are Rebel Cat Productions. So we're a female, female led finance company. And so we were looking for scripts, stories um, to fully finance. So that's, that's how I came to executive produce that. And then once we had decided on Andrew Hyatt's script, um, Andrew, I met here in Spokane, um, and he had previously just done Paul Apostle of Christ, which had with Sony and Sony distributed that. Um, so once we got together with him and decided that this was a story that we wanted to both develop and um, finance and make, um, we decided uh, also, I, I thought it would be a great idea to film it here in Spokane. Um, and so that's the financing end. And then once I was here, um, it was uh, a case of producing it with this wonderful film family I have here in Spokane and Misha was, has been a part of that previously as well. I've actually learned a lot from, from Misha as a filmmaker. I've um, had a lot of contact with Wes or some contact with Wes. So it, it's really nice to see you guys here and thrilled that you, you know, your film made it through because we were literally at that, that point mere weeks before um, the, uh, the shutdown, we, um, we had just finished filming in London actually. And then I cast it as well. I thought uh, I couldn't not cast it, of course. So I cast that and um, it's, it's so sort of surreal. I don't think I've done so much film in such a short space of time. I had the pleasure of casting um, SJ's film and that was a wonderful script. I, I remember us being in studio, I remember my little studio and lots of us being shoulder to shoulder. I mean, it seems like a bygone age, um, but it was a real pleasure to cast that. So, and it's nice to be here and to see everyone so well and thriving. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that's what I mean. I, th I think uh, we have quite a few people who are, who are triple threats when it comes, it comes to filmmaking. And, and that's partially a, a product of where we live, I think, a little bit, where we get more opportunity to test things out, try things. Um, I'd like to segue a little bit into um, talking to Wes and SJ about the landscapes in both your films, because I think one of the things that I've never seen before in watching those two, and I wish I could speak to all those small things, but I think eventually um, it's gonna come out and may go really big, so we'll all have an opportunity, um, is the, the representation of the city and east of the mountains. I mean, these are, these are iconic films. I mean, if you can't recommend them just for the subject matter, you have to say to all the locals, you have to see these films. I mean, Wes's is a love story to Seattle, really. I mean, among other things, it's not just that, but and East of the Mountains, um, you know, I mentioned prior the broadcast, um, my niece who's from Eastern Washington and her reaction to uh, the cinematography was just, oh my gosh, mom and dad, you have to see this. This is mm -hmm. such a beautiful rendition of, that's never really been done before as far as I know of, of Eastern Washington and, and sort of the beauty that you can see in that landscape. So um, SJ or Wes, do either one of you feel like you wanna talk about like what you were thinking as far as like just the imagery of your, your home state? I mean, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, 
Um, yeah, East of the Mountains is uh, is a, almost about landscape in some in some respects. You cannot uh, have this film without acknowledging the land and the landscape and um, various uh, various parts of the the state as well, not just you know one place. Um, it was integral to the story, actually. And if you read the book, you'll know that it is very heavy on apple, apple orchards and apple season and all this. And so we really tried to incorporate some of that in as well, but there's a big long walk that Tom Skerritt has to make out in the, in the big vast open and um, he camps overnight. I mean, they, there's just like so much outdoor shooting and um, Luckily, Sebastian has shot with me before, so he probably wasn't that surprised. <laughs> I don't know if you want to talk about that, Sebastian. That's a, that's a good setup for Sebastian to talk about this. So I, I imagine there were a lot of challenges. Um, I'm very familiar with that area because I we first moved to Tri-Cities over in Eastern Washington, and it's a brutal landscape as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the, the, the area I mean, you have, I have heard of the gorge and I have, uh, feel like I had some type of idea. Um, I'm also, uh, you know, the, a, a child of very European parents. So I never went camping. I never, I never, so it was odd, you know, um, in a way from, from me, cause there's a lot of friends that I have that are very familiar with, with that area, very familiar with camping and going hunting and doing these things. And these things were foreign to me. So I had to do a lot of research but I also think that that kind of helped as well as to be able to see the landscape in kind of a new way or see things in, an, in a different angle and having SJ there with me um, on mo many of the, the location scouting that we did um, I would always check in with her to make sure that is this what we're feeling here is this kind of what we're going for um, and we also had some really great help with um, David and um, Vicky to help with location. I mean, they just worked so hard to get those great uh, um, vistas. And um, yeah, it was, it, it's just a breathtaking area. Um, this, this state has so much um, that, that a lot of other states don't. It does have almost the four kind of big major uh, geographies and topographies. It's just a, a beautiful, beautiful uh, state. Yeah, I, I like that you said um, we're looking for a vibe. And that was very true. It wasn't just like, well, we're looking for a road that turns. It's like you have to feel it. And hopefully when you see the film, you'll see what I mean. Hopefully you'll feel what we were feeling, you know, and what, what our characters are feeling too within this environment. But it's, it's brutal, you're right, it is brutal. I mean, we took a beating and, you know, Tom Skerritt is a tough cookie, man. He was out there in high winds, so high the first day he shut down the set and I had to quickly like rewrite the scene to, to take place in a van instead of outside. <laughs> and, um, brutal heat. I mean, we, we had to cut the flannel sleeves off of Tom's shirt, you know, when, when he was hunting, which is just like painfully hot. And four o'clock in the morning, I mean, maybe the coldest I've ever been in, in like a, um, a wood uh, or a, a rock, rock quarry. I mean, it was unspeakable. So we just, and then of course, like all of a sudden it would pour rain, you know? So <laughs> we kind of got it all out there, but uh, there, that's the price for beauty, I guess. And Wes, you want to talk about, uh, you know, the, the landscape that we, we see throughout the film? I mean, there's so many, so many, school there's a school there's the space needle yeah i mean first i want to just add to the chorus of praise i i texted um sj yesterday because i rewatched east of the mountains but i didn't get to tell sebastian you just did such an amazing job you guys i really feel like um i have never seen washington state that way before you know it's like for the first time i feel like i saw a film that really does justice to <laughs> 
to the I, I can't think of any other movie that's really done justice to our um, sort of the natural beauty of our state in, in a way that East of the Mountain has in a very organic way. Um, yeah, for us, it was a, a challenge because it's kind of a period film. I came to the States in the late 90s. So it's a very, it's like it's close, but not really kind of, you know, in terms of production design and fashion and everything. And we, it limited how much, you know, for a low budget production, it limited how much we could shoot outside. Um, it kind of influenced how I wrote the film, but we were really lucky um, because the community has been so supportive. So the, the, the places that we did want, you know, really embraced us. Um, and, you know, like, I'm just so happy we got to shoot at Rebar right before Rebar closed, you know? Oh, man. Um, and so many other places that mean so much to me, like the Pretty Parlor, like the Crescent Lounge, that's like, I guess the oldest gay bar in Seattle, they told us. Um, a lot of the high school ended up being in Mount Lake Terrace, I think. And it was just the perfect high school. It, it, it was like very iconic and they were really welcoming. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it worked out. I was definitely nervous about how we're gonna <laughs> pull it off because the Russia sets were, you know, all on a soundstage, but the States had to feel sort of real and open and... Well, I think it's a collage too of, of the city, you know, because you have such a wonderful soundtrack. And so you're able to sort of meld everything that there is about Seattle, you know, especially during that period, having lived through it myself, um, you know, so in one way, we're very lucky to have this film because we will be able to look back on it and say, hey, you haven't seen that, you should watch it, you know, it, it's, it's an excuse to tell someone you should watch this film, you know, because it's got so many wonderful and I think it'll get it'll get, uh, you know, um, some sort of iconic status for that as well. Thank you. Yeah. I was, can yeah. I ask, um, there's a scene where Potato in, in Seattle um, is lying on his back. He's happy as a, as a lark. He's looking up the blue sky. Uh, where was that? That's Gaswork Park. Oh, and it was nice. definitely, it was literally what was happening with me at that point in my life. Like the first weeks that we got here, we, we lived in Fremont and I would go and the gas work and just lay there and just like take in how lucky I am you know and it was wow. it was amazing um to kind of be able to recreate it I mean it's definitely it's very much a love letter to Seattle especially Seattle at a certain time and um yeah um we, we love it, you for that we love you <laughs> Wes. thank you <laughs> Thanks for, thanks for making it happen. Finally, that film that, you know, captures that essence. And then Nike, I, I know I keep going back to this about having seen the trailer, the house and all of that. I mean, I'm starting yeah. with location as character for what people may not know and, and why this is so important. Um, but to film directors, I know this, um, when you're starting that process, these locations, kind of set the tone. And when I saw this film, if you told me that was shot in Washington, I wouldn't have believed you. Yeah. So just saying. Thank you. Yeah, that house was amazing. I wish I could remember the name of the, um, the architect and he has uh, various pieces also in, um, uh, in, in Seattle, but it's a glass box basically, um, you know, surrounded by steel. I don't know all the, all the technical terms that sort of juts out into the land it's it's extraordinary it's it was a nightmare for our um just looking at Sebastian here it was absolutely a nightmare for the cinematographer because you know it was literally a glass box so we were chasing the light fighting with the light um yeah it's 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 like a piece of performance art in its own right you know right right there in the landscape and we we got that because it it sort of matched um the idea or the personality of one of the characters um so yeah but it, it's exquisite extraordinary as well it was an incredible find 
and yes. contrasted it, you know, in really interesting ways with the uh, the architecture, the topography of London, of England. So it was a nice juxtaposition there. For the contrast, yeah, yeah. So, so segueing back to that, since you bring up Sebastian, um, cinematography wise, um, you know, Sebastian, you, you shot Lane 1974. And so this has become kind of a, 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 a dynamic duo, right? Um, I actually had somebody who wanted to work with both of you, but it didn't work out, but they were amazed. They were like, you can have both of them together? Um, and so that's the other thing is that um, I'd love for Wes and Nikki for you to talk about also, but, but let's start with SJ and Sebastian about this sort of synergy that has happened twice and, and Miss should jump in, you know, I mean, cause uh, you know, you're, you're, you're the person at the level where, where you're working with them and making sure they have what they need. But um, do you guys want to talk about that? Talk about your relationship and you don't talk to each other anymore, right? You're not speaking. No, true. <laughs> I, I'll just say that I owe everything. I mean, SJ has given me an opportunity that I um, am forever indebted and uh, I, I think that it's just very unique to Seattle um, that if you think about the, the directors, to, you know, today of, you know, the four kind of the people that we kind of think about, Lynn Shelton, uh, Megan Griffiths, S.J. Chiro, you know, Wes, and it's very um, female uh, energy and dominated and I'm just lucky. Uh, so S.J. is one of the pass it back to you, but also say thank you. Oh, well, uh, you know, of course, I consider myself very lucky because, um, you know, not, uh, not late 1974 was my first feature film and it was uh, very personal and I had a lot of um, very um, particular ideas. And also, as Sebastian knows, and I've already indicated, like I work a lot from feeling and vibe. And so if I were to work with somebody who was like, no, just give me the coordinates and I'm just gonna set my camera on, you know, like that would not work. And Sebastian was so, so collaborative, so open to, to, you know, we would sit and watch films together and talk about like, yes, this part, not that part. Like, and he would be like, what do you mean? This, uh, like, how do you feel about this? And like, what is that? You know, and, and that whole process is so integral to our process. So before we even get on set, before we even go look at locations, you know, we are getting together with like a mind and a spirit meld. And it's essential too, because um, the first film starred children. I mean, there were quite a few children. So that's, that can, you know, our star, Sophia Mitri Schloss is a pro. That wasn't really the concern, but we had a lot of little kids. We even had a three-year-old, you know? And so there are a lot of uh, unexpected things that can come up. So you, I needed uh, a partner, a director of photography partner who could roll with the punches and, and understand that, look, sorry, the location changed right now. Or like, I'm, like, I have to feed her, um, you know, some marshmallows to get her to do this. So like, come under here. And he was always just like, he would never stop and say, well, why do you want to do that? And because that's a killer, you know, he would just say yes and go, you know, and, and that um, I, I appreciate so much not everyone is like that. And Sebastian is an artist himself. He's a, he's an, he comes from an acting background, so do I. So I think like these kind of internal things he understands, he, he has that ability to comprehend something that is a little esoteric, you know, and people who are just like into their machines and that's it, yeah, probably wouldn't be a good fit for me. It's not the camera, it's the, it's the operator. It's the, it's not, as we say, it's not the wand, it's the magician, right? So it doesn't matter. You get, <laughs> well, you, I mean, you like the heart idea. matters. <laughs> I, think, I think somebody's heart matters, you know? I mean, Sebastian is very, very talented and, you know, and, you know, very up on all the mechanics and the, the cameras and like all the lighting, everything like that. But the main thing that is important is his heart and, and his spirit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, SJ. 
And you both come from, um, you come from a th theater background, which is interesting because, you know, doing this big wide open spaces type film, yeah, that, that would be essential to have a cinematographer who understands how to get those images as well. Yeah, for sure. I come from a theater background as an actor, not as a director. I do not like directing theater at all. I'm not good at it. I don't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, directing film is like, it's, it's just totally different for what you can see and what you can show. And, and in East of the Mountains, as, as East of the Mountains really demonstrates these kind of vast feelings that's tough to get in a proscenium. Yeah. So, so Wes, you're a cinematographer. How did you know that he was the one? Um, so I've been working with Vincent Pierce. He, um, he, his day job is he produces, directs, and shoots uh, Art Zone with Nancy Gabi and all of the a lot of other channel uh, Seattle channel shows. And I met him eight years ago, and we've just been inseparable collaborators. I th I think there's something to be said about just like um, SJ and Sebastian, like ongoing collaborations like that are so amazing because you really grow together and you develop sort of a shorthand and it's it's sort of like you become one artist that's growing and evolving together. And it's just such a gift, even though it doesn't always, for practical reasons, doesn't always work out. And, you know, it is exciting to branch out, but there's just something to be said for those kind of um, long-term collaborations and relationships uh, creatively. Um, Vincent is really great. We usually, I, when I write, I have a really um, specific, like I, I have every shot in my head kind of. So when the script is ready, I, we get together and we storyboard together. And then when um, we, you know, have our budget and production designer and reality sets in and we start working again together with, uh, you know, more realistic kind of uh, circumstances in mind, which is really fun, like a fun challenge. Um, but yeah, it's very kind of, I would say it's very structured and pre-planned um, for me, generally, cinematography, it's something... Um, something I don't understand at all is lighting. So it's always helpful. Like compositionally, I, I have painting background so I can always describe what I want, but lighting wise, it's really great because Vincent understands it. And um, we also work with uh, Bobby Aguilar, who's an amazing Seattle theatrical lighting designer, but he started working in film as well. So he, he's been working with me and Vincent for a while and he's really fun because I, my aesthetic is very theatrical. So, you know, Bobby can really get into it and be excited about it and not be intimidated by like, oh, this is not how movies are supposed to be lit. <laughs> and I will say that, that these two films, one's very theatrical and one's very natural, you know? So it's kind of exciting to have you both in the room at the same time, you know, because of the differences in the painterly idea from seeing the film, it, I hate to say this, Wes, but you've heard it before, I'm sure, that Wes Anderson, Wes Hurley, it's very similar. Sebastian's nodding his head, yes. <laughs> so if you love Wes Anderson, you're going to love Wes Hurley for anyone who's who hasn't seen the film yet. So <laughs> Thank you. most definitely. Um, I want to get to Nika again about, about the cinematographer, and then I, I'd love to talk about production design um, on all these films, too, and, and particularly Misha, because I think, I think on the production design side, I can't imagine what building the sets and doing all that with <laughs> Potato Dreams was like. So Nika, do you want to say anything about, um, you know, because you were executive producer, I'm sure you had a lot to say about um, who was directing and who was um, also shooting the film, or did you? Well, um, Andrew worked with um, Madrax, we call uh, Madrax, uh, who he'd worked with on Paul Apostle of Christ, Full of Grace, and this one. So this was their third collaboration together. So they came um, as a unit and I had seen Paul uh, and I thought it was spectacular. Um, it was clear they had a dynamic 
And really, um, as much as a producer, you know, um, I was just happy to see that. And I have a classical theater background. I, I'm, I don't know even what I'm doing in film because I'm really just a stage actor uh, that loves actors, that casts actors, that feels actors and all that. And so it was really interesting to move to bring that uh, the sense of how we collaborate in theater and the allowing between teams, the, allow, the allowing of whatever languages they needed in order to make something happen, the allowing of their flow. And I felt that from Andrew's script that it was really what I enjoyed as much as anything else was both feeling into it, watching the collaborations come together between the DP, the, the director, between the actors and the directors and really holding space for that. And, the, and thereby learning, uh, you know, various languages, um, languages of collaboration. And so I didn't really have a lot to do with the actual uh, cinematographer, but it was, uh, you know, I fall at the feet of most uh, DP cinematographers because they, they, there's something magical about working with light, is there not? And it, it's 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 something I, I that is not tangible. I can feel it. Sometimes I can see it, but it's always an experience. And so, as a producer, it was nice to watch that, support that, allow that. Beautiful. I I love that. And I think um, when you look at a film, and you can the sound people will hate me for saying this, but when you can turn it turn the sound off and just watch the beauty and the magic happen. It's, you know, a, a great cinematographer, like one we have here with us tonight. Um, you know, it, it makes all the difference. It makes the, you know, you can have a great story, but when it's also beautifully filmed, it just, it takes it to that next level. And so I think the takeaway for people who are watching who, who haven't, um, done their film and, and they want to be a director, find your DP, I think. <laughs> find the one, right? That's, that's the, uh, the right one for you. Well, what's interesting is that um, we had such a great time on Lane and we felt so bonded and we felt so together. And it was just a no brainer, obviously, you know, when I was hired on this um, East of the Mountains and they said, who do you want to work with? Obviously, Sebastian. And so I was like, hey, Sebastian, all right, let's go. You know, let's hit the ground running because we, we really did have to, you know, hustle. And I thought, well, this is great because we already have all our stuff established and it's so good. And, you know, but I really had a wake up call because every project is going to be a little bit different. And there were years in between, you know, that it was like three years where we hadn't worked together. And so I think it's it's worth it to take that time to reconnect, to rebond, and to to get specific about you know the the work that you're about to do. And you know, for me, this was my first union shoot, so it was really different for me. And I I kind of would kind of be like, uh, is this okay? Is that okay? Is this is this a rule? You know, because we had you know. We pretty much followed our own rules, except for, of course, with children, we, we followed those rules. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, we had a lot of freedom um, to do what we wanted to do in Lane. And then I did feel like, oh, this is a union shoot. There are very distinct rules. And I kind of like, for part of it, I was just like, oh, well, I guess Sebastian's with his crew and I have to be over here and I shouldn't go and bother them, but, you know. I really regret that. I regret that so, so much. And the next project we work on, Sebastian, just get ready because I'm going to be right like by you and <laughs> over you and, you know, with you and under you and just like around, you know, that's, that's the way I, we felt so comfortable and we would just like look at each other and have that that thing, but it's hard when I'm in now in Video Village and, you know, he's out here and he's going like, uh, is this what you want? You know, I mean, it was, it, I learned a lot. I really learned a lot. Yeah, and I, 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 it's, an inter it's an interesting thing to have uh, a bigger budget, to have more people and to have, it's like, great, now we got these toys and we can do things and we don't have to worry about 
uh, and it, it was really interesting to see how that kind of separated uh, and we needed to find another way to come back and, and just always a learning process and, and something that I think because of our relationship where we were able to, to kind of to come back on uh, but there there is that kind of escalation you know when when the budget gets more that the kind of everything gets added on um, I remember uh, talking to Todd um, uh, about his his um, uh, hunky boys go ding dong and I was saying to somebody I was like why I just wish that he had millions and millions of dollars and he was like I can't do that I can't do I don't want to do that because I can't do it the way I want. I don't have the same control. Um, so and it was a little segue there of just, just to, that it's not always a, a good thing. It's not always, a, uh, it has its pluses and its minuses to have uh, the budget and that resourcefulness. And I think that's something that Wes is really good at. at Cause when I went uh, to check out their set, they had, um, uh, just just Wes's attention to detail and also his camera placement um, is just really, really impressive. Um, so I just think that being creative and forcing that kind of part of your brain to work um, has its rewards too. I think that's a great segue for Misha to talk about um, both films and the differences uh, of that because you're an expert in this, um, you and I both walk those lines, you know, both union and non-union. Um, do you have, do you have something you'd like to say to us about, uh, you know, what that's like, especially switching from a union shoot to a non-union shoot? And you know, Wes has a cast of thousands, so don't be, don't think this is going to be a small film when you go to see it because it's not, <laughs> it's, it, it looks like a big budget movie. So I wanna just put that out there before you speak. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it is really interesting. Um, I love having that experience of being able to work with filmmakers and sort of feel out when you see the budget to figure out, well, where are the res where are the where are the most important resources? And regardless of whether you have, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or eight million dollars, um, it's 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 never enough. There's never enough time. There's, you know, it's 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 surprising to me because at each level of a film when I, you know, when I had the opportunity to work with Nikkei at um, North by Northwest, it's like, you know, I had gone from, you know, working on super, super indie to then, you know, having, a, you know, a couple of million dollars for, for films and then being able to go from that to, to back again, I worked on produce the off hours, which again, you know, is like this little bit and potato has, you know, this, this little bit um, but I, I think it really comes down to the vision and the talent of the director and the story and the team that, you know, that, that is created around it and, um, how, how to tell different stories. And in the end of the day, I, I really think that, you know, what was pulled off on potato is, um, is only possible because of the the goodwill and the community and the affection that people have for Wes and the team that was put together. Um, people came out and um, you know they they obviously were not coming out for paychecks. Um, and you know se seldom it's very uncommon that people do in film. You know it's like most of us if if we wanted you know good health care and cushy jobs we sure as hell wouldn't be here. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's it, it's interesting. Yeah, it's just really interesting. And it, it is not as simple as having more money makes things easier. You know, the um, I'm obviously, you know, very supportive of unions and the protection of labor, all of us as working and making things safe and reasonable. And and it it is tricky in film when you start to look through the scope of, well, once we get up to this level what does that mean down the line for everything else you know um 
so sometimes, sometimes for certain projects, it is better to keep things small and light and flexible and fluid. And, you know, on potato, I, I don't know how many locations we had, but um, when, especially, you know, on the, the Russian portion was all at the, um, you know, the Staples building in Burien, but the American scene was around in and around Seattle. And um, many of the locations, there's no way we would have been able to come in and out if, if we had, you know, 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 crew members, <laughs> like it, it just wouldn't have happened. And so we were able to, you know, do things that um, on East of the Mountains, it, it wasn't possible. And on East of the Mountains, we needed all that support and that infrastructure because we're out in the middle of nowhere with snakes and it's raining and, you know, it's, it's, it's brutal. Um, but I also, this is totally back to a different topic, but I was sitting here and I was realizing, Susan, that you and I are surrounded by actors. Every single, because Nikkei obviously is an incredibly accomplished, brilliant actress, actor, and as well as a writer and director. And, you know, it's like all these things and, and that lends itself to her casting, but also as a, as an EP and producer, I think it's um, just interesting. And, and Wes actually came into things acting. Um, so I would not act to save, I could not act to save my life. Um, but I do think it's, it just occurred to me as people were talking, as Sebastian and SJ were talking, that there's so many, just looking at the, the film landscape in general, there's so many different entrances and it's a labyrinth of, of where we all get to figure out how to tell these stories that we tell. Um, so I, I don't know what else to say about that, but I think it's really interesting that there's so many actors among us. And I always say we like being the behind the scenes people. <laughs> you know, if I wanted to act, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing for sure. Um, yeah, so so that's wonderful. Thank you, Misha. And, and Nikkei, do you have anything that you'd like to add as far as like, you know, scale, scaling up and down? Um, you know, production value wise or, or what's been your experience? You know, my experience is from theater and European theater um, and particularly Eastern European theater where there was uh, the greatest creativity came from having nothing. So for example, Grotowski's uh, towards a poor theater. And it's not that there was a celebration of lack, but there was this acknowledgement that uh, it didn't have that creativity and artistry was not to be determined or driven by money. And uh, I don't know, maybe this was just an excuse, you know, for being poor and trying to make theater. I don't know. But what happened was in Europe, you got extraordinary forms of theater with no budget or with smaller budgets. And so the body of the actor uh, had great currency in the process of storytelling. Space was seen as a premium. The body in space was, you know, and so I, I think I come with this idea that um, it's possible to, uh, you know, and I think it's great to have the money and, you know, not be over budget and all that. But there's also something to be said for having to think through our own sense of limitation in order to arrive at a different way of creating the story. And I'm, I'm a great proponent of that, actually working within the budget, um, even as I want, might want many more things. I see it as a really, as a welcome challenge. Although I don't know about snakes and rain, man. I couldn't have, <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't ask to visit set. No, it wouldn't have been, I would have, it's like, get me out of here really quickly. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, I think that's beautiful. Go ahead, SJ. Oh, just to say that uh, on our set, Blake was the snake wrang wrangler, and I was saying, oh, he kept us safe from the snakes, and he was like, correction, I kept the snakes safe from you guys. So <laughs> that sounds like Blake to me. <laughs> totally, totally. But but I think there is some beauty in that because all of us um, know that some films that had the most money I'm talking to Hollywood here were some of the worst films, you know? So that's a good point, Nike, that money doesn't necessarily determine whether or not your film's a great film. And, and uh, if I can just jump in again. Um, 
I am really thankful to have had the scrappy, scrappy, scrappy <laughs> background that I come from, you know. I think it helped even on a, on a bigger union shoot, you know. You have to be agile. You have to think like, how can I make this work? You know, things are going to happen. Money doesn't guarantee anything. And, you know, the, it's just you, you really do have to be agile. And so for people looking to come in, come into directing, keep that in mind. I, I, I don't know if you agree, Wes, but um, I know that you, you really design everything out. And, but I, I think that, that there's times where something is going to fall through and you have to think very quickly. Oh, absolutely. I, I think, and I think you have to enjoy that. You know, I think you have to enjoy that challenge too, because that's such a big part of filmmaking. If it upsets you too much, you're just not going to like yeah. what you're doing. And I, I think there's an element of excitement in all of those creative challenges and just thinking like, okay, that's not going to happen at all. So what are we going to do now? Uh, and that ha yeah, that happens in any, I think, on all productions. Anybody have funny stories about that that you want to share <laughs> about it never was funny, huh? When you did. No, it wasn't that funny at the time, but. <laughs> Not for the director anyway, probably for the crew. I'll do, we'll do a whole different, uh, you know, set up here with crew people and they'll tell us what really happened, right? <laughs> well, I don't know, on, on Lane, we, we it, you know, time kept marching on. We kept not having this location, not having this location. And finally, the night before, Janessa West, who was the producer on that, came to me and she was like, okay, this is what she would do when she had to tell me something. She would put her hands together and be like, okay. Uh, <laughs> how about that parking lot that we were in yesterday? And I was like, what? a parking lot because it was supposed to be uh, a gas station and a period gas station as well. And they were, the kids were supposed to go into the restroom and there was this whole thing, right? And, and, and I was like, a parking lot? And then she looked at me and she was like, I don't know what else to tell you, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, you're so right. Like we have to make this parking lot work. And then the three of us, Sebastian, Janessa, and I just put our heads together and we were like, okay, well, what about this? What about this? We could get this angle. We could put the telephone booth here. Uh, 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 it's gonna work. And it, it worked. I mean, I, I actually love that location <laughs> in the end. Wes, any stories? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that like changing locations definitely happened to us. Like we ran out of time um, shooting a high school scene um, and then the next scene we were going to shoot on Capitol Hill and it's like, okay, the, that's not going to happen. So we, we ended up picking a um, place nearby and it actually, it worked out for the better. And <laughs> it's interesting, even yeah. though I was frustrated, I was really frustrated about it in the moment, but it, 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 it did it end up looking much better than what we would have gotten where I was planning to shoot it. And you're a planner, so that was probably, being a type A myself, probably super frustrating for that moment. It was, yeah. It was definitely frustrating, but um, it worked. I feel like it always works out. <laughs> it works it always out works. at the end. Yeah. 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 If anyone who's done improv before is familiar with the term, yes, and. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hey, there's a lot of yes, and when you're a director. Yeah, yeah. So, so as far as uh, getting your films made, do you guys have any anything that you want to say about you know as people are watching this? I mean, these are these are incredible films, and I know you get asked this all the time. But is there is there like a pat answer on? Hey, I'm a director. I want to get my film made. Um, how come SJ and Wes and Nikkei get to have their films, you know, made? <laughs> What's the secret sauce? How does this work? <laughs> oh, Nikkei, Nikkei has an answer. <laughs> she's, she's shaking her head. Laugh. That's why I'm laughing at the question. Um, it's the, the question that people always want to ask. 
Yeah, I mean, I come at it from, so as a casting director, I can say, get your cast, uh, get your lead. How are you going to sell it once you've made it and make the money back, right? As, a, as an executive producer, I say, okay, here's the pot of money, but how can I make my money back so that I can make more films? Um, I don't know if there's a secret sauce, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, and I'm, I'm curious as to what SJ will say. But I, I think it's as much as anything about choosing a perspective, you know, why you're making this story and how you're going to make it. And, and then going from there. And, and it may not be that what works for one producer with a $5 million budget is the same as what's gonna work with for a director producer with half a million dollars. And so I think it's it's about what story do we want to tell and how do we want to tell this? Um, that's the best I have to offer at the moment. It's interesting financing for the first time um, uh, for a union, a union film because it brings a whole set of, as the financier, a whole set of other considerations based on of necessity, if that money will come back to the investors. Um, so that critically drives what you can do with that movie and things that have to happen in order for that movie to sell and make a return. Yeah. That's all I've got. Well, I love I loved something that you said for sure. If you're making a film, you better know why you're making that film. You know, if you're just like, well, somebody just gave me the script and I thought it'd be fun. Yikes. I mean, <laughs> that is a big warning sign. Um, you know, it has to mean a lot because you will go through a lot. And if it's, uh, if it's just kind of like, well, I don't know, I just thought it would be cool. Uh, you know, that's just not really enough to take you through the hard times. And there will be hard times. Look, there are hard times. But I can only speak to the way I did it. I'm not recommending this at all. But uh, <laughs> I started out with my little $300 and my good friends from theater. And I made my first short film. And you know, it's very clear about why I was making it, what I wanted it to look like, all, all this kind of stuff. And um, just kind of then the next thing I got uh, a 15 thousand dollar grant and I thought I was like in the money now I thought I was like Scrooge McDuck like throwing dollars and stuff and like it was gone in a heartbeat in a flash you know once you start paying people <laughs> as one should you know it, money goes fast but you know and then just making I made quite a few short films before I ever made Lane and to be honest with you Lane took a really long time so don't look at people like Wes or like me or like Nike or Misha and just say like, well, they just snap their fingers and their films get made. It's, it's not like that. There's a road. <laughs> it's a pretty long road. SJ, how many shorts did you make before Lane? Oh my gosh, now I have to count them. I'm gonna just, off the top of my head, I'm just gonna say eight. Might mm -hmm. be seven, seven or eight. And over what time period? long time so the first one um the first one took me a year and a half to make a 10 minute film <laughs> actually an eight minute film uh, <laughs> so i'll say it was finished in 2004 and then lane premiered in 2017 so i was also raising some kids in the meantime so <laughs> some pretty awesome kids but yes <laughs> And I would just jump in. I think the the thing that, that SJ is saying and that Nike is saying as well is for, I think for anybody who works in film, there's this preciousness to relationships and very few people get the opportunity to sort of be an overnight success. Most people who are filmmakers in whatever department or area that they're in, they are dedicating their lives year after year and making that choice to not take that stable career, but to, you know, to work freelance and to work 16 hour days and to do all that. And so I think that there's a level of commitment and 
sort of the vision for sustainability and, and long-term relationships, just as like when, you know, when films land in locations, there's a level of respected preciousness that none of us want to be the crew or the film that comes in and burns the location okay. where the next time next year, when, you know, Nikkei needs to film at a school or, you know, um, we, we don't want that school to be like, there's no way we want filmmakers in here because of X, Y, and Z. And it's the same way I think with relationships where, you know, it's, there's, there's something incredibly precious about that trust and, over time, you know, knowing who these people really are and for directors to succeed, I think they, um, at least in my vision, at least in this region, they are um, really amazing sort of people that know how to show up and have something to say. And, you know, there, there may be um, a cynical Hollywood culture where people can just come in and be assholes and burn through you know, things, but, but that's not been my experience here at all. No, it, it can't be like, you won't last. If that's, is, if that's how you behave in this ecosystem, you will not last. <laughs> Wes, do you have anything to add as far as like my original question about how do you do it? Cause you're, you're kind of, unique in the sense that you took the short film and then you made it into a feature, which is, I say unique because that's everyone's dream. Everyone dreams <laughs> of doing that. So I, I was actually told I had to ask you this question by a couple of people. <laughs> so, sorry, I don't know if you have an answer. You don't yeah. have to have an answer, but- No, I, 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 film? I feel like, I, I feel like when there's a will, there's a way. Like people, if you're really meant to make movies, you're gonna figure out a way to make movies. And I, it, it definitely hasn't been an overnight making a feature for me. Like I, the first feature I made, I didn't have any crew members and I didn't have a car and I would haul lighting equipment in one hand and camera in one hand all around the city, you know? And it's like, but I really wanted to make a movie and I'm so glad I didn't. You know, I didn't take a lot of film classes that told me <laughs> like, oh my God, what are you doing? You need a sound person, you need a lighting person, you did this person. But it's like, and the film is, was not perfect, but it got into festivals and it showed people in the community that like, I'm gonna finish the film. And so gradually the next feature I made, I had a costume designer and I had Sarah Crow helping me some of the days. And the next project I made, I had, you know, a production coordinator and a cinematographer and, and it's gradual. And now Potato was the first time that I was able to pay people and had a real producer, Misha, behind me. And so it's like, it takes, it took me many years. I mean, I really wish that it wasn't overnight, like, oh, somebody discovers you and thinks you're talented <laughs> and you get to do what you want. That doesn't, I think that's like winning a lottery. Like the guy who shot the commercial and then got to helm uh, Alien 3. And oh then we wanted to know why it wasn't that great. <laughs> it's like, well, there's a big difference between a 30 second commercial, which I have done, and a feature, which I have done. <laughs> and when they awarded that to that guy, I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> one's a narrative, the other's, yeah, <laughs> selling something, so right there with you yeah you're uh it's it's really remarkable and amazing um what all of you have accomplished i just i'm in awe of this panel in particular um and i think we may have questions i'm gonna ask if there are questions um so we'll see um let's find out if people have other questions for us Wes, I think I think the I think you helped on Lane, and I think that's where I met. I think I met you when we were in Shoreline. And I for, helped. I helped with Rocket Man. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say Lance came on Lane for the roller skate. <laughs> yeah, my partner came out to do hair. But, that's right 
Yeah, that giant seam that was cut. Did you, um, Wes, did you, did you come for the bus day in Shoreline or am I imagining that? Maybe I'm imagining that. No, I, I didn't, okay. no, I don't think so. No, I, I helped out a little bit on Rocket Man too. I mean, that's the other thing is that get to know your community because your fellow filmmakers will definitely feel your pain and will want to help you succeed. <laughs> and I mean, whether it's like I have brought homemade cookies to the set or, you know, or actually, you know, did craft services or, you know, I mean, I don't know what you did um, Wes on Rocket Man, but or Rocket Man, but um, you know they. This is this is how we do, you know. Um, we help each other, and you know, people who are just starting out find those people that, and start cultivating love and trust, and um, it's important. So it appears we've answered everyone's questions. Oh. So I think we should keep going here with just a little bit more about um, festivals and everyone I think here on this panel has done some festivals, uh, some festival what I would call work. Um, does anyone have any any advice for people about, you know, entering your films? I, I know I could give advice, but I'm not here to give advice. So um, about how to get your film into festivals how to choose the festivals. Um, I know, Misha, you probably have a relationship now with South By, potentially. I shouldn't put that out there, though. Whoops, sorry. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, Wes and I both do. Yeah, OK, so and we SJ, love too. you guys. <laughs> yeah, SJ. Just call them. They'll help you. No, I, do, I don't mean that at all. But do you want to talk about that, the, that process and, and finding out about, about getting in? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's I, it's sort of echoing the the same thing with that sort of like long term relationships with people. You know, film the film community is actually finite. It it it's always surprises me when um, my paths cross with people. You know, Wes and I when we had our short at um, South by Southwest met with a classmate of mine that I had gone to film school with in London like 15 years before. And he actually helped us with distribution. And it's, you know, so it, it is, I think a lot of continuing to knock on those doors and to let yourself be known, you know? And um, so now, you know, we know people at South by and, you know, because we've, we've all worked in the Seattle area, we know people at SIF and, you know, and, and any opportunity, um, and I'll give this ad, as advice, I seldom do it, but any opportunity that you have when you're at festivals to reach out and meet other filmmakers from around the world, um, every time that I've slowed down and taken the time to sort of network in that way, um, it's, you know, uh, repaid tenfold. And it, you know, it's been so, so nice because people who are dedicated to making films with their life usually continue making films decade after decade. And so there's something kind of comforting about, though it's not a small world, you know, there, there is a, a community around the world of people who are choosing to, to tell stories in this way. Yeah, I love that you said around the world, because even with my short films, I would really make an effort to go to those festivals. And I, I, just as you said, it pays off because now I, I mean, I know filmmakers around the world and, and we've grown and kept, kept in touch with each other and you never know what can happen. Actually, um, I met a filmmaker in, in uh, Shanghai and um, I, we were like five American films that were brought to the Shanghai Film Festival. And uh, he called me up the other day and he was like, oh my God, uh, we're coming to the Northwest. Uh, it, it's a surprise because our other location kind of fell through. So, um, you know, but he had me here immediately. Like I just met with his director and you know what I mean? He, and he's producing this film. So it, it's like, you need, you never know when those people are gonna come in a very big handy, you know I mean? Like, 
it's and it and it helps you feel less alone too because filmmaking can get very very hard and sometimes you just feel like is anyone else going through this you know and and then you know yeah. sure enough like there are a lot of people going through it all the time so so what was the what what advice would you give as far as how do you choose where to submit because i know you can spend a lot of money just submitting your films Nikkei, do you have any experience with that or is it always distribution for you first? No, it, it's not. And this is my first film uh, in, in a festival. Um, I don't, I, I think probably Misha and SJ can speak to it more, but I will say, you know, I learned, I remember Misha saying years ago, you know, the fact that we're on a panel together is, is, is you know, part of this, but, the film world is finite and, and what, you know, you'll keep on meeting the same people again and again. I think that's critical and it has helped me um, knowing about and really appreciating those relationships has, has helped me, has helped me to make films, you know, at, at any level, just, just having that sense of a community really wherever I am, yeah. Nice, thank you. And Sebastian, do you go to the festivals as the director of photography? I know they don't, they don't usually buy tickets for you or anything, but have you attended and, and met up with other DPs? I am so bad at, at networking. I, I will take, I will, if you fly me somewhere, I'll definitely go. We, I, we went to South by Southwest and that was just a magical experience. And West, we were, I think we were there the same year, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. It was just like, see, here are these Seattle people Nate, who I Nathan, who I really like, and who's helped me out a bunch, and it just speaks more to that community. Uh, but um, I, it's it's difficult to do to to network. Um, I'm not really that type of person who posts a lot or or does a lot of my own kind of marketing, and I should do more. But um, I think it really, if if you can't do that, to just to go to the parties, strike up conversations. You never know who you're gonna run into and how they're going to interact and intersect with your life later on um and yeah so yes I, I love going to festivals i love going and watching you know movies and seeing people and their work and uh i wish i wish i was better at networking though well as you said i mean sometimes it just happens naturally when you're hanging out in yeah. a group and then other you know directors or whoever says, oh, join our, you know, and then you get to talk to these people. It just like is organic sometimes. Well, and luckily, Sebastian, your work speaks for itself. So whether exactly. you actually show up at the festival or not, you've got a, a two hour uh, promotional piece that is sort of <laughs> hard to avoid. Yeah. That's true. Why well, I switched from being an actor to being behind. So I don't have to, it's the pressure I'm not good at. <laughs> of self-promotion yeah, yeah. <laughs> isn't it important that i, I mean I'm, i sort of lean towards sebastian i am really not very good at, at at doing all that um you know it's work for me to network in those very overt ways it's it's work for me to do the social media stuff but i value deeply any chance I get to have a one-on-one -on -one or a one-on-two. And I'm patient with that process. You know, I definitely can't gather a hundred names in my iPhone by the end of the evening, oh. but I guarantee a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, back and forth very gently, maybe over two, three, five, ten, ten 10 years. And, and so that's how I do it because that's my temperament. I think that's important to value that as well. That's beautiful. Yeah, and it's worked out. Yes, it has. Wes, Wes hasn't said much about about his festival experience. Anything, anything you want to add to that? I, I love festivals. I um, looking back. I mean, I started submitting to festivals on my credit card, <laughs> like <laughs> since the very beginning I mean I look back at films that I submitted I'm like I, like oh my god what, what was I thinking they're like horrible first films that didn't get into anything but I naively submitted from like Sundance to like <laughs> it's become more challenging because there's more and more of them now so it's like it's so hard to keep track and also 
even to understand which ones are legitimate. Like I would say um, one of the things that I started doing since there's so many festivals, I look for ones that on like free film freeway, the ones that were around for a certain number of years, because there's uh, something to be aware of. There's like a lot of fake festivals or festivals that are kind of semi scams where they will accept you and give you even awards, but they don't really fully exist <laughs> as festivals. It's like a racket. So, and I, and I have submitted to those in the, in the beginning of my career. So I just, that's something to be aware of when you're using Film Freeway, just look for, for things that were around for a long time, unless you know the organizers and you, you know, they're good people, but, um, but I think it's worth it because, it, it, and it's also submitting to festivals is a lot like lottery. And unfortunately you have to play to win and you may not win, but you're not going to win if you don't play. And it's like, you never know. I mean, I'm always surprised. Even like major festivals will sometimes accept first time filmmaker. Like for some reason, a film would resonate. And sometimes I'm like, I'm not sure how they got in, but they got into, you know, South by or something. And it's like, it's worth it to give your baby a chance because it takes so much work to make it. And why not give it a, you know, give it a chance in life. Yeah, and just that's, to, oh, go ahead, SJ. Oh, just quickly, um, you know, they always when when you're head down and you're just making your film, and then like you've finally gotten through post production, you're like, look, my film. Then you suddenly realize, I need a budget to submit to festivals, <laughs> and that is like so sad. You just start crying sometimes, like no. <laughs> more money now to raise more money but it's true and and one thing that I've heard from a lot of festival programmers is um, understand what your film is and look for those festivals that are open to that now if you have a like a, a sci-fi film you might really point toward sci-fi festivals at least to start you know and then a lot of the, those programmers, let me tell you, here's a secret about programmers. They know each other and they talk and they will tell like, oof, no, don't take that one. That person was horrible to me. They called mm -hmm. and demanded a, a this and that and this and that. And like, and and it gets around. So just be careful, you know, be, be your loving self and your kind self. Because if you start like being a jerk, that's going to get around to programmers. So SJ, you learned that the hard way, right? I learned it the hard way. I'm <laughs> a jerk. That's <laughs> why you're so nice. Now you're nice. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's I've so heard true, programmers so talk true. about other people and they're, you know, they work very, very hard and they just don't have time for somebody to be a jerk to them. And they also cross-program a lot of things. So what I noticed um, is, you know, like we wouldn't get onto Sundance, but then the same program, like one programmer from Sundance with programmers at this festival, then another one with programmers at this festival, then another, you know, and it's like as tempting as it is sometimes to email back and be like, <laughs> fuck you, how, I, how come you didn't program my film? I hate you, you know? <laughs> I mean, I would never do that, but it's definitely, you know, I think as, as an artist, it's hard not to be, uh, sensitive about your 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 art and want people to support it but yeah don't burn any bridges because people do um it's a it's a very small world and most programmers work for multiple festivals like they will work for four or five or more festivals throughout the year mm -hmm. and i was just gonna jump in and offer like super dumb practical suggestions of like um, you can ask for, for vouchers. You can ask for them to, to waive fees. If you, you know, if you have the contact of individual, you know, programmers, you can say, listen, I'm, you know, in this situation, would you, you know, is there a way around it? And the other thing that I've done is when I'm looking at festivals, I look at 
what cities I have um, family or friends that I can stay with <laughs> and like what areas would I want to travel anyways to. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like I'm not paying for a, you know, a flight to, you know, to New York City to stay in a hotel. It looks more like, well, I've got a buddy who I can crash on their couch mm -hmm. and I was going to go that route anyway sort of thing. Um, which, which helps kind of with, with the costs and the, you know, trying to figure out which ones to attend and which ones not to. I'd like to pick up on uh, SJ's point. And I, I, I feel that pain of, you know, you make the movie and then there's no more money. <laughs> oh my God, I could almost weep, but um, you know, it, it, it come, I, I raise that because it's uh, a question maybe to ask at the beginning when you're making your film, maybe on 20,000 or 100,000 or even more, which is what do I want to do with this film? And, and is, it, is it for distribution, straight to distribution or will, might I want to share it with the world at various festivals? And if, if, if that's not you who's making that decision, then you've got a producer or a line manager or someone who is partnering with you to help you think through those things. Because it is, I mean, at the end of the movie to not have the financing to complete post, to do p &R, to it's just miserable. It is miserable. It feels as though your life has stalled along with the picture, you know, so, yeah. And it's also speaking for um, working at a post house, it's miserable when the filmmaker comes to you and says, we have no more money, but can you post the film anyway? You know, and you do it, you know, you find a way, but we know that it all got burned up making the film, right? So, you know, I don't work at a post house anymore, but, but I always remember that as being sort of one of the hardships for the post people. There's no money for you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> all the love went into the other side of the film. So, yeah, and I, I would also say, um, for, from a festival point of view, um, and this advice was given to me, I know I'm not on the panel, but do you wanna be a big fish in a little sea or a little fish in a big sea? And some of the smaller festivals, you know, will, will give you a really wonderful package and treat you really well, just cause they're so grateful to have your film. So um, if you get invited to Napa Valley Film Festival, you go, that's all I'm gonna say. Free wine, free food. <laughs> the whole entire time a red carpet with where they're just handing you bottles of champagne <laughs> so every film every person who's there um yeah so i have a i have a little bit of a, a i have one question that came through that i think is a great wrap up for this and and this has been so amazing but um tamara asked what was the single thing that has prepared you most for the career that you've chosen A single thing. Wow. Uh, my acting training, I think. You know, my experience as an actor. I think um, really being okay with so called failure. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I anything prepared me for what I've chosen. <laughs> Still not prepared. Not prepared. <laughs> I think it was like learning along the way and failing and figuring it out and having lots of disappointment and lots of excitement and yeah. That's a great answer, Wes. I love it. <laughs> Nothing can prepare you. No, uh, <laughs> anything. Um, I've always just um, I was uh, one thing that's always really actually been for me is is uh, playing basketball uh, and being able to. Since I was small, uh, I had to, I was a point guard, so I would just kind of organize. And I think that being able to quickly think on your toes and try to problem solve. Um, in that type of environment has always kind of benefit. I'm a kinetic person. Um, so play to your strengths, I think is one of the things that was really um, 
kind of important to me. Um, um, but all the other things, as far as my um, my personality, who I am, trying to, you know, I'm still working on. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't even feel like I've, you know, made it in any way. So I, 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 I'm still, you know, I, I take things from everywhere. I'm always learning and always, um, um, yeah. So I feel like, um, and just also the, my surrounding. I was thinking about this when I was being on to be asked to be on the panel of my biggest mentors in my life have always uh, been women. My mother, uh, Dr. T for acting um, and SJ and KT Neoff. I thought I just, there's just a very special relationship. Uh, and this is a special city. Um, sorry, I'm segueing here, but uh, I just feel like it's um, um, very lucky. I'm very, very lucky to be in this um, community and in this in this field. Nisha? Yeah, that's so nice. Um, I, I, before I went to film school, I grew up on like a goat farm, so it never occurred to me that I could work in film. And I was gonna, I was gonna go to law school before I made the decision in my life to go into film. and. In preparation for law school, I took a weekend workshop on a conflict resolution and mediation. And it's funny because then I proceeded to like spend far too much money going into debt to attend this London film school master's program. But what, when I'm out on sets, what I actually use is that day and a half of the <laughs> conflict mediation. And it's, it's like, that's, I, I could have just done the day and a half and then gone straight into work <laughs> if I had known. Um, but it's, it, it's, it, it has been communication. It's, it's about relationships and communication. And, and that I think um, has, you know, served the people that I know and, and served me really well. And working with people that you love and that you enjoy. There's, there's so many assholes out there. And I can just say that none of the faces of people on this call, they're also lovely, lovely, wonderful people. And um, so hold out to, to work with people that are, that are wonderful. Totally agree. Wow. Thank you. That's, that's pretty amazing. And, and thank you, Sebastian, for, uh, from Women in Film, that was a great um, shout out for um, all the women filmmakers because we know it hasn't been easy for a lot of us. Um, yeah, so we are, I think that's a wrap for us. Um, we wanna thank all of you for coming. I mean, this has been, and it has been recorded. Um, so I, I think we can direct people to it if people want to, you know, they had to do something else tonight or we're watching a film at SIF, who knows. Um, but we want to thank um, our community partners, SIF, and give them a big shout out um, for always um, supporting us. We support them and they support us and they support our filmmakers. So um, we love them for that. And I see that Abby's come on. Abby, do we need anything else to say here? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so sorry that I, I didn't get a chance to, to see all of you. I've met all of you virtually, um, except for Nikkei, because I've like been in your classes <laughs> every chance that I can get. Um, I was actually on set with Sarah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and uh, it was wonderful because it was a 95% POC cast and crew. And so it was like, something I've never ever been a part of before so so you mean uh, Sarah was Sarah was the non-POC Sarah, Sarah was Sarah the was non, the non the, the one non-POC person on um, there today so it was it was definitely well okay well, one of the actors right <laughs> but um yeah no it was just it was something that was just really beautiful to see and it was really comfortable and you know I'm glad that Washington is finally heading in that direction, <laughs> um, you know, compared to, you know, being able to count on one finger or one hand, how many people, <laughs> you know, are on a film set that you can relate to. So um, I'm just, I'm glad that we were able to have all of you tonight. I know there was a lot of communication 
Um, but I am just absolutely appreciative of all of you, you know, being a part of this. I suck at lighting, so I'm sorry. <laughs> just going to let you know. That was one of the things that we were dealing with all today, how to light skin of color. So that was fun. Um, but yeah, once again, I'm, I'm really happy. Like I was actually watching like while I was driving down, I put my phone in, in my little holder thingy and I was like trying to listen to the conversation because you know, these are some amazing people that are part of this panel and I have seen your names in so many things. Um, Wes, I was fortunate to actually uh, view Potato Dreams before you guys submitted it. So uh, oh, thank thanks, you. To, thanks to Sarah. I was like, what am I watching? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I like, I saw so many people in the community and I was just like, oh my God, I love this film so much. <laughs> So um, yeah, I'm just, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm absolutely appreciative for all of you, you know, having the time, um, spending your time with us tonight. And uh, for those people who are viewing, uh, SIF is still happening until the 18th. So please, please, please go buy your tickets, check out these films, vote, vote for your favorite film. Um, you know, they'll all say vote, <laughs> vote for, Vote for um, as many films as you possibly can and, and show appreciation to all of the other filmmakers, including the ones that are a part of our panel right now. Um, and then um, I also wanted to say, make sure that you are ready to come by for May, our next TST. We will announce the information on that here soon, but that will be May 11th. Um, and Susan already said it, uh, thank you to our sponsors. Susan, thank you. Thank you for moderating, seriously, because um, you, you, you know, were amazing. It was just nice to know that everyone has that, that connection and everything. And I look up to all of you. <laughs> so um, I, I am a follow, trying to follow in all of your footsteps. Uh, I, I got a chance to AD on this, this short and, uh, you know, I was just finding out there's, there's a huge shortage of ADs, uh, especially ADs of color in the Washington area. And so um, it was definitely a wonderful experience and you know, I'm glad that I got to do it and I definitely wanna do it again. So um, here's to more filmmaking in Washington and here's to the Seattle International Film Festival. Uh, everyone, thank you again for joining us and have a lovely night. Thank, thank you. you. Everyone, thank, thank you all. Thanks. All the best.